Open up your eyes, take a look at me Get the picture face in your memories I'm driven by the rhythm of the beat of a heart And I won't stop until I start to stand out Welcome back to Every Disney Movie Ever. My name is Justin. I'm watching Every Disney Movie Ever. Today I'm talking about a goofy movie and we're doing something a little bit different. We're doing the first virtual guest. Quarantine has got us good so it was a great time to attempt doing a virtual guest and Carol Ann is here. I am so excited to be back on Jess's channel and watch another movie with you guys and talk about it. Carol Ann and I are filming our parts completely separately. We are not talking over like zoom or anything i gave her all the notes she knows what to do so if our parts feel a little disjointed or it isn't like a conversation toward the notes portion don't get upset it's really uh our first time doing this and we're going to be working out the kinks of virtual guests because friday there will also be a virtual guest so Let's get started. A Goofy Movie is a 1995 animated theatrical release. It is directed by Kevin Lima, who is best known for Enchanted, Tarzan, Aladdin, and this. The animation director for this movie is Gaten Brizzy. Just covered him in the video of DuckTales, Treasure of the Lost Lamp. The link will be down in the description. Paul Brizzi, I also covered in the video about DuckTales, Treasure of the Lost Lamp. The link will be in the description. Steve Moore is best known for the indescribable mm, Redux, Riding Hood, Despicable Me 2, and sing. The film is edited by Gregory Perrier, and he is best known for Sing, Despicable Me 2, Enchanted, and Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. The underscore was by Carter Burwell, who is best known for Carol, The Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, Fargo, and True Grit. Jack Feldman did the music for the songs with words, and I covered him in the video about Newsies. The link will be in the description. The music is done by Tom Snow, who is best known for Footloose, Chances Are, Ladder 49, and Oliver and Company. The film is written by Jim Megan, Chris Matheson, and Brian Pimentel. Jim Megan I covered in the video about DuckTales Treasure of the Golden Suns. The link will be in the description. Chris Matheson is best known for Bill and Ted 1 and 2, Evil Alien Conquerors, and this. Brian Pimentel is best known for Beauty and the Beast, the live action and animated version of Aladdin, and Tarzan. The film stars Bill Farmer, Jason Marsden, Jim Cummings, Kelly Martin, Rob Paulson, Aaron Lord, Tevin Campbell, and Polly Shore. Bill Farmer plays Goofy, and I covered him in the video about Goof Troop Christmas. The link will be in the description. Jason Marsden plays Max, and Jess already covered him in the video about Hocus Pocus. Link will be down in the description. Jim Cummings plays Pete, and I covered him in the video about DuckTales Treasure of the Golden Suns. The link will be in the description. Kelly Martin plays Roxanne, and Jess covered her in the video of The Richest Cat in the World. Link will be down in the description. Rob Paulson plays PJ, and I covered him in the video about Goof Troop Christmas. The link will be in the description. Aaron Lore plays Max's singing voice, and Jess covered him in the video D2, The Mighty Ducks. Link will be down in the description. Tevin Campbell plays Powerline, and he's best known for Boys in the Hood, Steel, A Thin Line Between Love and Hate, and this. Polly Shore is uncredited as Bobby, and Jess covered him in The Encino Man. Link will be down in the description. The film was originally going to be a TV special, but they changed their minds and decided to make it a theatrical release, and Kevin Lima got to have his directorial debut. The first change that they made when making this movie was actually to Max's age. They made him older. Believe it or not, the story was inspired by a personal experience of Jeffrey Katzenberg's where he went on a road trip with his estranged daughter and they became much closer afterward. And this honestly has just made me realize how much influence Katzenberg had over a lot of the Renaissance films because he had a lot of leeway in lion king he had so much personal stake in all of these films the film actually had a much smaller budget because lion king and pocahontas were both in production during this time a lot of the animation was outsourced to france australia spain and canada the original release date for this movie was slated to be thanksgiving 1994 but one of the monitors that they used to capture the animation during production had one dead pixel and therefore it resulted them in having to recapture three-fourths of the movie. Jeffrey Katzenberg told Bill Farmer to change Goofy's voice to a normal voice for the movie. And so Farmer was like, okay. And he did, and he recorded dialogue like that for a week and a half. 
And then Disney and Eisner heard it and was like, absolutely not, go back to the Goofy voice. So they did, and I cannot imagine how it would have been if Goofy had a normal voice. Like, that's Goofy's voice. He still can emote all those wonderfully deep emotions and still have that voice. Just... Principal Mazur is actually named after Jim Maggin's real life high school principal. Tevin Campbell was 19 when he recorded the music and he danced in front of a green screen so they could take his moves and use it for power line. Pat Bertram, the Possum Park guy and longtime Disney actor actually died during the production of this film and so it is dedicated to him. The film was released in April of 1995. It's got a 59% on Rotten Tomatoes. Pretty mixed reviews, but for the most part, people were upset it wasn't goofier. Believe that or not. It made $35.3 million in the box office. The film has a direct-to-movie sequel called An Extremely Goofy Movie. As I stated earlier, this film had many deep connections to Jeffrey Katzenberg, and because of tensions, he ended up being let go. So the film itself just kind of died out and that's why it didn't do super well. The film actually garnered a cult following and during its 20th anniversary, during the D23 convention, they had expected it to be a really small panel and it turned out to be one of the biggest panels during the D23 convention. Caroline and I have access to each other's notes, but again, this isn't gonna be like a conversation. It's pretty much really gonna be kind of us delivering our notes and we definitely have overlapping opinions there are quite a few notes Caroline has that I also have um I don't know how I'm gonna edit this I really this is the first time we're doing anything like this so we're just gonna see how it goes as much as it's sad that we won't be able to like have a conversation about it at least she was here and got to like give her opinion and all that fun stuff and she probably um illuminated some stuff I didn't so my notes are all over the place but first and foremost there is just so many like mickeys and little mermaids and um walt disney much just like there's so many like easter eggs in this because it's goofy and they get to do that like they they get to make those um funny haha you know like mickey's actually in it mickey and donald are hitchhiking and then they're at the concert, and then there's a Mickey Mouse phone, and then like the Walt Disney keychain, and the Walt Disney mansion, and then there's a little mermaid in the background of this, um, behind the curtain on the stage at the beginning, and then there's a little mermaid light switch in the Neptune Inn. Like there's so many Disney Easter eggs in this film, it's crazy. And then other things that follow through are like, in the open road song, the just a week of rest and relaxation and the odd romantic episode. Those two, the ma little man and the big lady, um, the big lady is the lady at the end who sings that, how do I? And you know that because when they're being put, like when Goofy and Max are being snuck in as the instrument cases or whatever, one of the men pushing in the instrument cases is the guy who was driving and then you see the woman just before she's got all her like wig and makeup on when goofy goes into her dressing room on accident and gets punched out those are the same people which is crazy that it carries like through that bar like they were all road tripping to get to the concert which is fun okay now <laughs> those aside the easter eggs all of that fun stuff aside i love this movie. I've always loved this movie. I think this movie has some of the best Disney music of all time, the Powerline songs. Literally anyone who's like a diehard Disney fan, the Powerline songs are a bop and we all wish there were more. I mean, come on, for real. One more countdown that I noticed that I kept seeing pop up during the movie were the nuns. I noticed it a couple times and then once they kept coming up more frequently, I noticed that they had popped up at the store when Goofy was taking pictures. And then during the open road song, they made their view there as well. And then they were in the diner when Goof finally let Max be in charge of navigating and the master of the map. And then they popped up one more time in the monster truck rally. And I just found that very interesting that they were just random nuns thrown in throughout the movie. One one of the things that I always distinctly remember about watching this movie is the opening scene like in the field and then Max turning into like the giant goof zombie type thing like I distinctly remember like when it got really dark and scary and the scene like turned around and then you saw like Max with the giant goof teeth like I remember that kind of scaring me 
as I was a little bit of a kid and I just like always distinctly remember that. One thing that I had definitely forgotten though is that this one, the first one, was much more of a musical style than the second one. I had kind of forgotten that but as soon as like I heard the beginning of quite a few of the songs. I was like, oh yes, I remember all of these. So that was kind of a pleasant surprise as I was rewatching this because it has been a really, really long time since I've watched the original Goofy movie. There were a couple of things where I was like, hmm, that's a really interesting reference to put into a children's musical. One thing that I was a little cringed by was one of the guys who was in the trunk like obviously some sort of mafia deal had gone wrong and he was tied up in ropes and had those cement shoes on and he was about to swim with the fishes and i'm like oh okay we're gonna throw this into a chipper children's musical song that and a zombie like they've got the hearse going and then the zombie is just up there chilling out dancing i was like oh okay we're gonna throw that into a happy tune and then it makes it all okay i don't know if anyone else has ever noticed this but principal mazer when you see in his wide shot of his office he's got an entire like section of his wall dedicated to spanking paddles which is so <laughs> insane and then i know caroline agrees with me on this principal mazer telling goofy after max's single infraction that we know of that his son is a gang member and is going to end up in the electric chair is so inappropriate that it's disgusting and I also, piggybacking off that, love this movie really is just trying to preach open communication from both persons. If the parent isn't honest, it's going to cause issues. And if the child isn't honest, it's going to cause issues. Because if they had just talked about what Max did and why and all of that kind of stuff, Goofy's an amazing dad. He would have completely understood. And he does. After they have their heart to heart, he totally understands. It's like, we gotta get you on that stage. Like, how amazing is that? Other parents might have been like, we're not going on that stage. Are you nuts? There's no way we can get on there. We're just gonna have to go tell her the truth. Like, but Goofy's like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna find a way. We're gonna get you on stage. Which is amazing. Goofy's so incredible. As an educator, when the principal called Goofy and that conversation just escalated incredibly quickly, and I believe just noticed that too, like that entire conversation was just so not okay. Like, as an educator, I would never ever tell my parents or anybody that their child is going to end up in the electric chair that is like a super uh -uh, no-go in education. So that conversation is definitely something that would not have been had in today's educational setting and Jess and I both noticed that and we're really cringed out by that whole scene. PJ has always been one of my favorite characters. I just I really dig his vibe and like how he looks at life. So he, PJ was always one of my favorites. There's so much in this film that is iconic, but I think <laughs> Bigfoot with the Walkman and Bee Gees is probably some of the most iconic stuff to ever happen. And you can tell my when I do my walk, I'm a woman. It's so funny. And then just along with that, Goofy and Max is having this friction and their awkwardness and inability to say I love you like hurt my soul to the very depths. I was so sad <laughs> because they're adorable and I love them and I know they love each other but they were like so awkward about I love you being spoken out loud and that made me sad. And then I also got very emotional when Max was doing the perfect kiss to get his dad back up from falling down the waterfall. Um, I got very emotional during that. One thing that really, really resonated with me was how much Goofy love children and the scene where he has to take photos of all the kids just the way that he interacts with kids and gets their attention and gets them to like smile for the picture just like warms my heart to death i just like really fell over that a ton and one thing that i caught and i don't know if it's it, but when the little girl who was being like a brat to Pete, but not to Goofy, and he like velcroed her down to the chair, when she was crying, it distinctly reminded me of the cry of Tommy Pickles from the Rugrats. So I want to say that's who it was. That was a fun little Easter egg in there. Every time I watch this movie now, I really wonder if they're ever going to make another one and expand on what happened to Max's mom. I know it's been a very long time asking what happened to her what who was she did she leave did she die 
what happened and I really want to know. I want them to expand on that. I love a Goofy movie. I love the sequel and I just really wish he, they could give him another movie and expand uh, because Jason Marsden sounds exactly the same. Bill Farmer still does Goofy. Give him another one, please. And freaking tell me what happens. <laughs> My heart also melted during the river scene, like when the car had gone tossed over and they were finally having their big heart to heart and Max told them the truth on everything. It just warmed and melted my heart when they finally were able to have their heart to heart floating down a car that would definitely not be floating in regular circumstances. So that was just a very sweet scene and moved me. And I really liked all of the caves and like rocks that they got to go through. And I thought that animation was really pretty, especially them going through the cave in particular. I just love that blue reflection on there. I thought that was great. I also thought that Roxanne was a bit harsh and quick to judge Max when he was telling her that he couldn't go. She's like, she wouldn't even bother to listen to his explanation of why like hey my parents like my dad wants to take me on a trip like she was just like oh you don't want to go with me i guess i'll find someone else so i thought that was kind of very like harsh in her quick to judge way of doing that i adore this film i think it is so genuinely good and underrated i mean more so it used to be underrated now i know for sure like i mean that giant freaking 25th anniversary panel or 20th anniversary panel was huge and I know there's a giant following for this film I mean oh I should have worn my goofy movie t-shirt I have a powerline t-shirt and I didn't wear it throughout a good chunk of this movie I'm actually not a big fan of Max's character because he's a total brat in my opinion like I get when you're in high school and stuff, it tends to like, you tend to have that emotional state of like, my world revolves around me and what I want is most important. And I'm sure I was that way a bit in high school, but now being older, I'm like all for the adult side. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why are you just being such a turd during this entire trip and being so mean to your dad who just like wants to love you and spend time with you. So when Max goes through his growing moments, I obviously am like super like, yes, growth. We love personal growth. But there is a large chunk of this movie where I am not a fan of Max, I'm just a bit of a big brat. I found it really fascinating that Pete is such like, in my opinion, not a very good parent or a dad, but PJ is like such a good kid. Like he's just like happy and go with the flow and is like, yeah, dad, like let's go on. Like didn't seem that it appeared to me in any way that he like fought his dad on this road trip to spend time with him. And then here's Max like moaning and complaining the entire time. But like Goof is such a loving father. And so to have like a jerk dad and a good kid and then a good dad and a jerk kid, like I just find that dynamic very interesting to see how they portrayed that. I love this movie. I think it's finally starting to get the following it truly deserves. I know a lot of people that love this film. I don't think I've ever spoken to someone that doesn't like this movie, which is saying something, especially for a movie that didn't perform well at its time. And I hope, again, with all hope that maybe one day we'll get a, th a, a third movie. The sequel is great, but it was direct to video, which made me sad. And it wasn't a musical, which made me kind of sad, but the sequel was great. I can't wait to get there. Um, that's everything. I'm pretty sure Carol Ann is done. We're just giving you our notes now. I don't know how it's going to work. Um, but that's everything. Carol Ann's final rating. My final rating for a Goofy movie is going to be a solid 8 out of 10. It was a lot of me reminiscing and remembering watching it with my parents and watching it with my friends and just kind of putting me back into that mindset of being a kid. And so I just really enjoyed it. And I thought the movie was incredibly heartwarming, especially watching it now as an adult and kind of siding with the Goof as an adult more so. I'm just like, oh, you were such like a good amazing dad and it warms my soul so much. So I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. My final rating is 8 oh, concerts out of 10. Our total movie count is 
Parent Asshole and Craig Hunt are still the same. If you want to keep up with the movie I'm watching when, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, you'll find out the movie I'm watching when. Thank you so much to Carol Land for being here in spirit and virtually. This has been amazing. Quarantine is crazy. I cannot wait to see Carol Ann in person when all this is over. I'm so excited that I was able to be Jess's first virtual guest on her channel. And I hope that this went well and it looks well. Have fun editing it, Jess. I'm really excited that I was able to be a part of it and I hope it works out great. I snuck her. It's probably blurry, but Carol Ann gave me a mini version of herself. So um, here is Carol Ann right here in person with me. Join my Patreon. We're doing Patreon requests and all that fun stuff over there. Until next time, comment, like, and subscribe, but I'm not in charge of life. You are, so you do you, and don't be Pete about it because he is just a terrible friend. Don't be Pete. If we listen to each other's hearts, we'll find we're never to be far apart. And maybe love is a reason why, for the first time ever we're seeing it, I do I. Got it. I like that one. Use that one, Jeff.